So uh, before I get started, I just wanted to check this. Uh, uh, Marco said on the first day that uh, the second most popular topic that people reported they were interested in before they came was this single object spectroscopy mode. Just want to survey the room. How many of you are potentially interested in single object spectroscopy when JWST is finally operating? Please raise your hand if you are. Excellent. OK, that's not so different. I'm also curious, uh, it's hard not to think of this as the exoplanet mode, because people are so excited about exoplanets. How many of you actually might be using this for something other than exoplanets? Excellent, good, OK. So uh, a nod to those of you that are, uh, feel distracted by all the exoplanet stuff that we're talking about. I'm still going to focus mainly on exoplanet. No. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, these are the 16 science templates that are currently defined in APT, four per instruments. I've highlighted in red the ones that, we're, that I think we're talking about that might be used for single object spectroscopy. Uh, one of them hasn't been mentioned yet, but I will mention it. Yes, sir? Uh, didn't I highlight it here? Uh, so I, I did include the MIRI medium resolution spectroscopy, which is an IFU. Uh, I left uh, the near spec one out because I think uh, uh, you do want to use it for 2D spectroscopy. That's what I'll say later. But, but for uh, just taking a spectrum, I think you're better off with the fixed slits. But I will discuss the near spec IFU as well. Um, but so I didn't highlight it because I, I, I would recommend, except for doing integral field spectroscopy, I wouldn't use it. Uh, yeah, no, thank you for asking, uh, the defender of the IFU. Um, so the numbers in red are the number of optical configurations that are available. There's other parameters like number of amplifiers and subarray and all that kind of stuff, complicated, right, to choose. But uh, they're actually, I mean, a good way to look at it is optical configurations, because if you want to measure a transit or take a spectrum of some other source, you're going to have to do one exposure for every one of these optical configurations that you're interested in. So um, we'll go, I'll, I'll show them more later. But there's a total of 16, and that's a lot. And so that's why Marco said, hey, Jeff, why don't you tell everybody how to choose between those 16? So I, I won't give you the, the final answers, but I'll give you some thoughts and uh, put some uh, talking points up. And then uh, maybe we can have a discussion about uh, you know, what the trade-offs might be during the, the question and answer period. So the first thing, in my mind, the most important thing is wavelength coverage versus spectral resolution. Different types of science need different things. We could go on at length, but uh, wavelength coverage in uh, exoplanet land, it's my uh, perception that uh, more than half the community feels like wavelength coverage is the most important thing. They want to study these uh, processes where you really need a long lever arm to distinguish clouds and haze from other things. Um, but there are many types of science where wavelength coverage is more important than high spectral resolution. I admit I'm in the minority. I come from ground-based high-resolution spectroscopy, and there's a lot of information there. Uh, so detecting narrow spectral features. There's also a systematic thing. Uh, you can bin the high-resolution spectra back to lower resolution, and then you'll be averaging over some of the pixel sensitivity issues. How important that's going to be, not entirely clear, but it, it certainly can be done. Um, but a downside, of course, is if you, if you really do want wavelength coverage, if you go to higher resolution, you're going to be spending, uh, you're going to be going back three, four times uh, instead of getting it all in one shot. So it's, it's expensive. Here's a visual representation of all of that. These are all the, the modes that I highlighted, all the templates that I highlighted. Um, so uh, starting at the bottom here, uh, if you want to get complete wavelength coverage and you're willing to work at low resolution, you can do it in, in two settings, uh, going all the way from 0.6 to 12-ish microns. Uh, if you want to get the highest possible spectral resolution, then uh, there are actually, uh, <laughs> I know it doesn't look like uh, uh, seven, so let me just go through this in case you haven't seen it. Um, this is actually the same grading, one grading, but the wavelength coverage is, is more than a factor of two. So if you don't put a long pass blocking filter in, you'll get two orders, first and second order, overlapping. So if you want to get the short wavelength, you use this particular uh, long pass filter, but then you stop at about 1.3 microns because you'll have order overlap. 
Um, so uh, there's actually two optical configurations here, same grading, but two different long pass filters. Then uh, there's another grading and another grading here, and that's near specs high resolution. Then uh, these guys, uh, the MIRI uh, MRS, medium resolution uh, spectrometer, which is also an integral field unit, it has 12 gratings, right? But the good news is it has three dichroics, so you get to do four gratings at a time. So in one shot, you'll get the blue ones. In a second exposure, you'll get the next one over. And in the third and final exposure, you get the last one. All right? So there's three MIRI settings and four near spec settings to get the full wavelength range at high spectral resolution. And then all manner of things in between. I'm, of course, that's not the only way to go, but those are, those are the bounding cases in my mind. right? Uh, and you can then pick and choose. I only need two high resolution, or I, I need medium, or whatever. All right. So uh, faint targets, so not exoplanets in general, right? Um, I would say, you sh uh, personally, I think you should use the uh, near spec and MIRI slits, right? I mean, w if it's a faint source, you want to avoid uh, the dispersed background light. Your sensitivity is just higher uh, if you use a slit. And so that's what you ought to do. Um, in particular, the talks we just saw uh, say, and I believe them, that near spec is two to five times more sensitive than near camp for these um, single object spectra, depending on uh, exactly uh, what modes you're using. And MIRI is 10 times more sensitive with its slit than without its slit because of the background. So straightforward. That one I'm willing to say, that's, what, that's the right thing to do. Um, the IFU slide for you, Torsten. Uh, please pay attention. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, if you want to go beyond 12 microns and get a spectrum, you have no choice but to use uh, the medium resolution spectrograph, which is an IFU. So uh, that's good. Um, there are some concerns if you want to do exoplanets. Uh, uh, people are, uh, the, the instrument team is cautious when I say, can I use it? They're saying, well, we're not sure. We need to study it some more. So I believe them. We need to study it some more. Uh, one of the issues is it has a slicer, and, and uh, when the source, the part of the source that's near the slice, there'll be diffraction, and small motions may cause the light to move a lot. Um, so, uh, but uh, for any other sort of source, I think you know it's it's absolutely a good thing to do, and maybe eventually exoplanets. We'll have to see. I already explained the three setting thing. Uh, below five microns. Uh, so if, if you want to do 2D spectroscopy, you really should use, I mean, use the IFU. You'll get the slices. You'll, you'll get the spectra. Uh, get your 3D data cube. Um, but otherwise, you should use the slit, because the way near spec is designed, uh, there'll be no contamination from light uh, leaking one way or another through the MSA shutters, which are not all perfectly opaque and closed. Um, you can still do that, and there are ways to correct it, but it's just much simpler to use the slits. So um, that's the answer there. All right, next up is uh, saturation limits. Uh, this was the hardest chart for me to put together, I have to tell you, because uh, there's so many different ways to decide how to set the bright limit. And so I put most of them in columns here, uh, but it, I couldn't make them all self-consistent. So this chart is not for you to say which instrument can do the brightest thing, uh, because they're not all on, a, on an equal footing here. That's just too hard. But it does show you in this column, which I cleverly hid in the bottom line in the middle column here, um, that's the, the sorts of magnitudes that you can expect. All right. So working backwards, we, we heard that um, MIRI uh, LRS uh, can, uh, in, in the uh, slitless mode, can get up to about 5.5 in K-band. Uh, Tom told us that uh, if you use the four amplifiers at, at a time uh, that you can get to these bright magnitudes. This is the brightest, right? Uh, right, I'm supposed to be using this, I guess. Um, and then uh, with the nearest, uh, the cross-dispersed mode, right? If you go down to just one group, uh, you have two choices. Uh, remember, Chris showed us that you can get both orders, first and second order, in a larger subarray, right? So that's this one. Uh, and then the magnitude limit is you know, seventh magnitude in J. Uh, this I, I saw from his talk, I guess I got it wrong, was 96 instead of 80, not that anybody cares. But if you, if you make a smaller subarray and just get that long uh, first order, then you can go up to sixth magnitude. Um, near spec, it just depends what band pass you're in. Uh, the prism, well, let me start down here. So uh, the longest wavelength 
uh, where uh, uh, well, the longest wavelength, you have the best limit. It's, it's fifth magnitude at high dispersion. That's really quite good. Uh, dropping to sixth and then 6.6. .6. The prism, uh, if you want, uh, all of these I'm doing are for com getting the entire wavelength range unsaturated. And the prism, around 1 to 2 microns, the dispersion, that's where it has a resolution of 30. So the counts pile up. And that's what sets this actually uh, uh, quite faint uh, limit at which you start to saturate, which is a shame because that's a really broad uh, coverage. If, if that didn't saturate like that, it would be uh, 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 everybody's favorite mode, I think. Um, there's still uh, options if you're not interested in the entire wavelength or uh, you, can, you can certainly use it for other, other parts. All right, so I think that's everything I wanted to say there. Uh, I did it for G2 stars, and like I said, this is to get the whole wavelength range. Some of the stuff you see in the plots is, well, if you only want a subset of the wavelength range, then you can do this, o other combinations. All right, uh, now uh, there's been a lot of talk about uh, uh, aperture versus not aperture, slit list good. Uh, and uh, I think uh, beauty is in the eye of whatever the instrument you're working on has in this case. And I don't think it's crystal clear what the best choice is. Um, so NearSpec is the only instrument uh, that would use an aperture for doing these types of observations, for exoplanet observations. Here now we're just talking about exoplanets. People are worried about you know, small uh, uh, variations in, in um, in the flux due to uh, aperture effects at the, at the edge of the aperture. So um, NearSpec has a 1.6 by 1.6 arc second square aperture. Uh, the PSF is truncated by that, the far wings of it. There are speckles out there. And as the, uh, P, as the position of the star jitters back and forth, you know, speckles move in and out at the edge. They're way down, though. Uh, uh, it, it's at a very low level, as I'll show you in a minute. But it does happen. And then uh, targets can drift as well. So here I'm saying targets can drift. Um, the most likely scenario for a target drifting, JWST is supposed to be quite stable because it's hiding behind that sun shield. It's thermally quite stable. It's not going in and out of the sun. Um, but the star trackers are going in and out of the sun. They're, they're, they're on the hot side, of, on the illuminated side. And also, the star tracker has very coarse pixels. And every once in a while, the bright star you're, it's looking at crosses a pixel boundary, although it's really not that common. Um, so, but if the problem is with the star tracker, what's going to happen is uh, the uh, observatory role is going to change a little because it's being read differently by the star tracker. But the FGS is going to keep the guide star in exactly the same point. So I'll show you in a minute what that actually does. So let's see. Um, and I guess, yeah, so you need a little more information to get this. Uh, right, so the jitter being truncated in, uh, in the near spec aperture, uh, the calculation based on a realization, uh, one particular realization of the wavefront error you might see says 40 ppm error. Um, which you can average down because ha every exposure has that, every integration, sorry, has that 40 ppm. And the photon noise itself is bigger than that. So you can average that down as you go through your time series. So that makes it sound like it shouldn't be a problem. Uh, uh, and then uh, it turns out the orientation I'll show you is such that um, roll errors are perpendicular to the spectrum. So you can actually measure when the th spectrum is moving up and down. And that might let you do some sort of decorrelation uh, uh, analysis to remove any errors caused by the spectrum uh, moving. All right, so I just want to show you two plots to, to reinforce some of these points, and then I'll, I'll make my recommendation. So this plot is from Bernard Dorner's PhD thesis. He worked with the NIRSPEC team as they were, as they were building the spectrograph. Um, and the circle shows slit losses, uh, uh, and the key point is how much they vary. And so there's a gradient of large variation in this direction and not so much that way. And the net result is 7 milli arc second jitter. Uh, sorry, 7 milli arc second jitter causes uh, 40 or whatever it was, uh, 40 ppm uh, variations for this particular realization of the, of the PSF. The other thing I want to show you, this is the focal plane. Sorry, I've, I've, I've got it rotated for some, from some of the other uh, presentations. These are the guiders, the two guider windows up here. So somewhere in those two squares is where your guide star is going to be while you're doing the observation. And if, uh, if you have a roll error, if there's a guide star here and it's pinned and the roll changes, 
then uh, the, this spectrum and near spec that we're, we're working on, it's going to move along the spatial axis. And you can measure that easily, right? Uh, uh, and, and do this decorrelation trick. If the, if the star is over on this corner, then the angle is slight, not quite perpendicular. And if it's over in this corner, it's not quite per perpendicular. But quite by accident, the arrangement of where the instruments are and the, and the guider is, it turns out that roll error makes the near spec spectrum move uh, along the spatial axis. Um, Miri one, I'm, I, I've got right. Uh, these two I, I, uh, I tried to get from documentation, but I, I have a little disc disclaimer here for posterity that I, I am actually not 100% sure how those are oriented. All right, so the bottom line on slit versus slitless. Uh, so the slit does cause flux variations as the target moves, no doubt about that. Um, you can measure the location of the spectrum and use that information to try to correct it. It also just sort of averages down over time. And, but uh, it is certainly true that uh, there's a risk there because you have an aperture. And we will do some measurements on orbit. For sure, the near spec team will. And I suspect the community will as well. And we'll see what happens. Um, slitless uh, doesn't have that problem. But uh, there is the contamination issue by, by uh, neighbors, which Chris showed us. Um, but as he showed us, uh, in many cases, you, or if not all cases, you can choose an orientation such that you won't have, uh, the overlap won't actually be bothering you. Uh, aside from those issues, I think uh, everything else, there are lots of other problems to worry about, and they're all the same, regardless of whether you have a slit or not. So that's how you decide whether it's important to you about a slit or not. All right. So uh, these are just recapping the points that uh, I have said are important to consider, your wavelength coverage and your spectral resolution. That's mainly driven by the science. And that will probably trump most of the other issues. Uh, you'll, you'll, if you need a certain thing, you're going to try that mode, even if it has an aperture or there might be contamination or whatever. Um, bright limit is going to be an issue. Uh, if your target gets bright enough, then you, you rule out some possibilities, like the prism is the one you're going to, the, the near spec prism is the one you'll lose first. There's the slit loss and the contamination, which I just talked about. Some things that I haven't talked about, there's bright limit again, which what I meant to put there was um, uh, near cam has uh, that uh, ability. Uh, it may have gone by quickly, but while you're busy taking your spectra, Tom pointed out that you can also do imaging with a weak lens in the short wavelength channel. And that's actually a huge benefit because you have some information. First of all, you have a whole other time series to study scientifically. And second of all, you can watch how that time series is moving. Even though it's a weak lens, you can still see uh, if the telescope is rolling or moving in some direction and use that to decorrelate any uh, errors you might see in your flux curve. Uh, and then there's spatial smearing, uh, which is a good thing in this case. So. Uh, Chris mentioned that he showed us the cross-sectional profile, the, the cylindrical lens in the nearest that makes the profile be 30 whatever pixels wide, right? So that's, that's something to consider. That's a good thing because it helps average out over pixel to pixel variations, which is one of those sins that all of the detectors have. Uh, things we didn't talk about, um, how close does the spectrum go to the edge of your subarray? Uh, some instruments have bigger subarrays with lots of background. Some have smaller. That's definitely something to think about. Um, repeatability of spectrum location. Uh, we talked about uh, the nearest guy showed us a plot of how theirs varies. But um, uh, it, ideally, if you could always go back to the same place, that would be great. Um, so what is the impact of not being able to do that? Uh, and then uh, when target, uh, target motion, are some instruments more susceptible than others if they're farther away from uh, FGS or who knows what? So that's it. I'll leave these up uh, to help stimulate the discussion. Maybe people have something to add to the list. They want to comment on these. And we can go back to the other, other items as well. Thanks. <laughs>